Welcome to the Right Take Podcast, news, ideas, and conversations at the intersection of politics and culture, a project of the David Horowitz Freedom Center. I will be your host, Mark Tapson. Greetings. Welcome again to the Right Take Podcast. I am your white, Christian, conservative, cis-heteronormative male host, Mark Tapson. Thanks for joining me here again at the intersection of politics and culture. Speaking of the culture, it's easy to complain about the state of the entertainment industry and to hate on Hollywood and all of its wokeness and its open contempt for middle America and its values and its people. And by middle America, I'm talking about sane, normal patriots, no matter where they live, whether it's in the American heartland or in blue cities like Los Angeles, which is close to where I live. It's easy to complain about the entertainment industry, but much harder to do something about it. As I've mentioned on numerous occasions, many conservatives have simply and understandably turned their backs on Hollywood and the mainstream entertainment industry. They cancel their Netflix accounts. They cancel their Disney+. Plus. It's getting harder to find good movies and shows that aren't packed with left-wing political messaging or explicit sex and an almost pornographic obsession with graphic violence or that aren't trying to normalize the freakish behavior of the woke left. Many on the right now including many of the high-powered figures that I have had as guests on the Right Take podcast, like Dinesh D'Souza, Andrew Clavin, and Michael Walsh, are talking less about taking back the main institutions of the culture, which the left has captured, like Hollywood, and they're talking more about creating a parallel culture, a kind of alternate culture in which conservatives create our own films and TV series, our own entertainment, and very importantly, our own distribution systems for that entertainment. Some of that's already happening, for example, over at the Daily Wire, where they have an actual movie and entertainment division. I absolutely believe this is a wise strategy for reclaiming the culture. It doesn't mean that you don't also continue to fight in the mainstream culture and don't continue to try to take back the cultural arenas like showbiz and education and academia and the news media that the left long ago infiltrated and seized control of. But there's no reason why we can't and shouldn't become culture creators ourselves, for ourselves. And when I speak publicly to conservative audiences about the decadent and corroding state of our culture, they want to know what they can do. They don't want to feel helpless or just sit around and complain while the Titanic goes down. They want some action items. And I do offer them some suggestions about things they can do in their own lives, in their own sphere of influence, in their own communities. But the fact of the matter is that it's hard to move the needle of the culture unless you own your own movie studio or publishing company or social media network, etc. But you know, my guest today on The Right Take has proven that that's not an entirely correct way to look at things. He's an aspiring filmmaker a white conservative Christian, I might add, in other words, someone who isn't likely to get a very fair shake in today's Hollywood, which is already difficult enough to break into. He's a guy with no special contacts in showbiz to speak of. He's not independently wealthy, and he decided not to bother with the usual path of breaking into showbiz, and he's taken matters into his own hands and made his own feature-length film almost single-handedly for less than $10,000. I've seen the film, and it's not just an amateurish vanity project to show to his friends and family. His film has won awards on the film festival circuit, including a Best Directing Award, and has earned favorable reviews among critics. Pretty inspirational and impressive. So we're going to talk about that today and how he pulled that off, and then talk about entertainment in general and what conservatives can and should do to create the culture that they want. So stay with us, and don't forget to subscribe to the Right Take Podcast. Make sure you don't miss any of the great conversations like the one we're about to have here at the intersection of politics and culture. And please leave a review if you like what you hear. Don't touch that dial. My guest today at The Right Take is filmmaker and my friend Paul Rowland. He's a native of Pasadena who graduated from Cal State Northridge with a degree in media management. 
but he's been pursuing filmmaking since high school. He's written six feature film screenplays and just released his directorial debut called Exemplum, which was produced on a budget of $9,500 with a skeleton crew of four people. Paul himself wrote, directed, and starred in it. Paul Rowland, welcome to the Right Take Podcast. Thank you for having me, Mark. Congratulations on the film. First of all, you legitimately can be called a filmmaker now. Uh, you put this you put this ninety minute film together almost. What is it, how long is it? Ninety minutes. Uh, it's ninety six minutes long, exactly. Yeah, yeah, right. You put that uh, film together almost single handedly. Your first film, and it recently earned you a Best Director award. Is it the Pasadena Film Festival? That's correct. Yes. Now that's got to feel like some major validation and a great kickstart to your film career. First one out of the gate, and you're a Best Director. <laughs> well, it felt. I, I can definitely tell you, it, it was a. a a joyous day uh, when they called my name uh, for that award. Uh, we were up against uh, films with over a hundred thousand dollar budgets and and full working crews, and uh, to be able to to win that award uh, was 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 truly something. I did not expect that to happen because when you're at at film festival, it's already hard enough at film festivals to get into them. And then, you know, when, once you're in them, you have no idea what the jury or selection community, uh, what kind of criteria they have for judging your film. So it's just a crapshoot. And, and, and they selected us for that. And I was deeply thankful. Fantastic. Now you credit Ingmar Bergman, Fritz Lang, and James Cameron as the three main influences on your filmmaking style. Now those are the three names you don't ordinarily hear linked together. What is it that you found inspirational about those directors? Well, that's very, uh, I'm glad you asked me that question. I haven't really spoken with that, uh, uh, with people that often. Uh, so I mostly say, um, I, I identify with Fritz Lang's, uh, for his plots, uh, most especially M. I find M to be one of the best films ever made. Uh, just such a fascinating, uh, plot, uh, just, just how uh, complicated it gets about the serial killer on the streets of Berlin. And it becomes this cat and mouse game between, uh, the plot and the, and the, being the police and the criminal underworld. And, uh, it flips it on its head at the end, uh, where you think you hate someone so much. And then you realize that, uh, that you, you know, that person is a human being and the people you think are good people actually are not the good people. Uh, so that uh, for Fritz Lang for that, and of course, I mean Metropolis is is one of the. I, mean, it's almost, I think it's almost a hundred years old now, and uh, it's still an amazing visual piece of cinema to watch. And um, I say Ingmar Bergman for his themes. Uh, if you notice, especially in this movie, uh, especially in, in, in Exemplum, uh, it's very Ingmar Bergman heavy uh, in terms of its reflections on spiritual spirituality and Christianity. Uh, and the conflict in uh, in man. Uh, I don't agree with all of Ingmar Bergman's conclusions, but I like how he asked the question. Is what I like to tell people. And then, lastly, James Cameron for his spectacle. Uh, there is just uh, I, admit, I don't think a filmmaker has existed uh, since that has been able to match him in terms of spectacle. Every single one of his movies uh, are an experience. To even if you may not agree with every one of his positions, uh, they're always an experience that you have to get out there and enjoy. And you've also written six screenplays, uh, which says a lot about your passion for filmmaking, actually, because in Los Angeles, there are about 4 million people and every one of them has written a screenplay, but the number, but the number of people who have written two or more, that plunges pretty significantly. And then people who have six under their belt, you can say they're, they're serious about screenwriting. What are these all kind of in the same genre, um, as exemplum or, um, what, are, what are the others about? I know, I read one of yours, a, a kind of a medieval horror flick, which I thought was an interesting concept and uh, and a great story. Uh, what about the others? Yeah, I like to delve in all different types of genres. I would say my primary passion is in fantasy. With the one that you read, it was then titled The Bound. Now it's called Nightfire, and it's changed dramatically uh, since then. I mean, that was kind of my first stab at uh, feature screenwriting after I've written some short films. Uh, so, uh, that was a, that was a dark fantasy. Uh, I still very passionate about that film and we'll get back, hopefully get back to it another day. Uh, but I've also written, I've written a sci-fi film, um, that took place, uh, took place on uh, New Year's Eve, 1999. It's about aliens that, uh, um, travel through space by hurling their consciousness across the universe, um, and taking over the comatose human bodies. Uh, and then I wrote a political thriller, uh, that was kind of more in like a $2 million uh, range. And then I was also commissioned to write a screenplay uh, 
I'm a friend of mine. Uh, this was this was uh, really fascinating. Uh, she had optioned this book called The Village Bride of Beverly Hills. Um, she had uh, worked with various different writers on it. And then she finally was doing another draft. And she posted a writer friend of mine to see if he could do it. He didn't have the time, so he recommended me for it. And this was a, a, a romantic comedy about an Indian arranged marriage. So it was completely out of my, my wheelhouse. And it was, I loved it. I actually always tell people that's uh, the most fun I have ever had writing something because it was out of my wheelhouse and I was diving into a genre that I hadn't really worked in before. Uh, and it was just fascinating learning about this, this culture, this Indian arranged marriage cultures, how they have marriage brokers that put people together and how these marriages, even though they're arranged, are actually very strong. I, I loved writing that film. Um, and it was after, actually after that, I, I wrote another short film that I had intended to create, but in the process of Finding the money for that, that's when I just decided that I was going to create this low-budget uh, feature film for $9,000, and that became Exemplum. Hmm. Yeah, I'm going to talk about that, uh, about how you got that project off the ground in a moment. But let me just mention that I've seen the film, and you know, I used to be part of that world, um, part of that Hollywood world. And I, I know lots of actors and wannabe filmmakers who went out and made short films to showcase their work, and they, they tend to be pretty amateurish. This is not that. I have to say Exemplum is really impressive and I was really hooked to watch all the way through. And I, I can't actually say that about most of what I watch on Netflix. <laughs> uh, it felt like it had an interesting, unique concept. Uh, the plot went places that I didn't expect. And the characters were all sympathetic in the, the literary sense. And unlike a lot of low-budget films, also you had multiple locations and the acting was outstanding. Uh, it didn't have the budget of, of Avatar, uh, but, you know, big budget's pretty meaningless if the characters in the story aren't there, and yours has those elements. Um, so without giving away any spoilers, can you tell us a little bit about Exemplum and what it's about? Absolutely. Well, first, let me say, coming from you, Mark, that means a lot to me. Uh, I really appreciate that you like the film. Uh, and so secondly, um, so Exemplum is uh, about, you know, how about I just go ahead, because I think it's really important um, so people can understand the, how I came to this story. It's important to understand how it all kind of began, uh, because um, when you're working film at this level, uh, it's uh, you have no artistic freedom. Uh, zero at all. Everything that you decide in your film is really based off of the economy. So uh, when it came to gathering the film, I, uh, I originally had this idea about a priest that uh, starts recording his confessions. I didn't know why he was recording. I didn't know what that would lead to. It was just this idea in the back of my head. Okay, there's a priest that's recording his confessions. That's an interesting concept. Uh, and so um, at the time that I was gathering funds uh, for my previous short film I had written, uh, I would, of course, I was reaching out to Mike Finch of the David Horowitz Freedom Center, who is your boss. Uh, and I had collaborated with him before. He had been very generous uh, in contributing to my projects, projects previously. And I said to him, hey, I want to make a feature film. Uh, at that time, my price was 6000 And I said, I want to make a feature film for $6,000. Do you think you can help me out? And he was like, yeah, I think we can. And so after, you know, uh, going back and forth with him for a while, uh, he finally, he gave me the, the check for 6000 uh, about a week before the pandemic hit. Uh, and yeah, and so after that, I had the green light to go ahead and make this movie. Uh, and uh, so, like I said before, when you are running at this level, you have no artistic freedom. So... I knew that it was going to be about a priest who was recording his confessions that I knew. And I knew I could at least do that on a budget because I knew I could at least get a Catholic church for free because I knew par uh, pastors here in, in city of Pasadena fairly well. Uh, I knew I get a Catholic church for free. I knew I could maybe get a house for free or, you know, and a restaurant for relatively cheap or free. Uh, and then I could just gorilla shoot it on various uh, areas you know if i want to shoot on the street i knew i could get that stuff done so i constructed this entire story around that around what i knew i could get for free and within that that came kind of the inspiration for a lot of the plot that unfolds so in the film that you see it's about a priest that starts recording his confessions out of paranoia and then in that uh recording he becomes obsessed with them and starts playing them back and formulating psychological profiles about people. 
And as he's formulating those psychological profiles about people, he starts, comes up with this idea for a show, an internet show of his called Exemplum. And what Exemplums are, are uh, morality tales, morality plays. Uh, if anybody has read uh, Chaucer's The Partner's Tale, that's what you, uh, you would know what I'm talking about. They were uh, uh, poems or short stories typically done in the Middle Ages that were about people's foibles or moral flaws and usually leads to their downfall in the end. So he takes those recordings and because of using people's sins that they're relaying to him in private, he starts playing them back and creating these stories called Exemplum, and he becomes very big on social media and on Twitter and on YouTube, and he becomes this Catholic media sensation. And then through corruption and bureaucracy in the church, all of that gets wiped out. His show is canceled, his platform is silenced, and so he suffers through a crisis of faith, and then he decides to take one of those recordings and blackmail a wealthy parishioner with it. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about some of the other themes in Exemplum? Uh, you mentioned one already. I, I recognize some themes of lightness and darkness, uh, chaos and order, good and evil. I like that you incorporated Solzhenitsyn's notion about the line that separates good and evil running right through the middle of every human heart. Um, so there's a lot of depth to the characters in your story, but also I thought the themes were really thought provoking and interesting. You want to talk about that a little? Oh yeah. I, I really appreciate that question as well. I think not to, I didn't set out to create this kind of story. It wasn't like, Oh, I, I, I want to tell this story, but I think this is just kind of what it became in terms of just, the, this is the ethos of a man recording confessions and keeping them to himself. And I do think it is a philosophical and spiritual meditation on what we know today as cancel culture, not in a, not in a political sense. I think that the word term cancel culture gets thrown around in a political sense where it's like, you know, people, I'm on the good, good, the good guy in cancel culture. You know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to cancel anyone, but I think all of us have the propensity to cancel people. I think all of us have the propensity to judge or hold a grudge and, 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 and take people's wrongdoing and use them uh, for power and, and gain and benefit. And I think that's what a, a lot of the film is, is a reflection on that. He takes people's sins, uh, he records them, and he uses them for his own gain and his own power. And then, and in that, he uses it to try and des to destroy people. Uh, and that's why uh, you, I'm glad you mentioned uh, Solzhenitsyn that's quoted in the film, um, because I think all of us, we have this tendency sometimes, uh, especially with all of our divisions and, and our, our, our cultural divisions, our political divisions, to think that, well, we're just got to find the evil people. You know, we'll just find them. We'll find the evil people and we'll put them in a room. We'll lock them up and everything's going to be great. Everything's going to because we're all good, right? You know, I'm good. You know, it's like, but, but the heart, uh, but evil runs through the heart of every man. And, and who is willing to destroy a piece of their own heart? Uh, and if you become too, too consumed with the evil inside other people and you forget about the evil inside yourself, it could destroy you and you become a monster. Uh, now, did you let me back up a little bit and talk about the financing for this thing? Did you uh, go to anyone else or try to get uh, financing anywhere else before you went to uh, Mike Finch, the president of, of the David Horowitz Freedom Center, either for this film or for any of the other projects that you had, um, you know, that you were working on? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I had, uh, I mean, h and Project, I, I had tried to get off the ground, but uh, Hollywood is an incredibly difficult place. Uh, I don't care. I mean, it's, it's conservative Hollywood is a very difficult place. Catholic Hollywood is a difficult place. The, everything is... It's extraordinarily hard to get anything uh, done or get anybody to, to give you give you an opportunity and look at your stuff. And and Mike Fincher is one of the few people uh, is uh, who actually did give me an opportunity and, and believed in me. And I, I give him full praise and credit for for, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, and I hope that I uh, I, that I delivered upon uh, my promise. Uh, so he was the first person I approached this, and he was the first person, and he was pretty much the only person that I was uh, looking. Uh, to see uh, he would finance the film uh, at the time. And then after the script was written, I was able to get another one. Uh, I was able to get another thousand dollars from my friend, producer friend, Lynette Tariki. Uh, and then I was able to get another 2,500 from Seth Dillon of the Babylon Bee. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, him and I were sort of email pen pals uh, throughout uh, the years. And I sent him the scripts and said, hey, I'm just looking for extra financing on this. And he said, Paul, I haven't read a script before, but I'm glad that this is the first one I've read. And so he agreed to help me out in that regard. And so he earned an executive producer credit. Wow, that's very interesting. Well, I can tell you that my experience, my personal experience, uh, trying to get funding for quote unquote conservative projects, it's really like pulling teeth to get money out of, uh, uh, you know, affluent or wealthy conservatives. Has that at all been your experience in, in terms of trying to get, uh, you know, conservatives with money to finance anything? Or it is extremely difficult. It has been extremely difficult. That's, you know, I, I can, that's, that's the short version of that. Obviously, you know, I, I, but you know, there, there, there are good pockets, you know, people that you can find, you know, like, you know, Mike Finch helping me out and stuff, Dylan helping me out. And there are, you know, wonderful people out there who I think really do care. You just got to, you just really got to find them. It just, it's, it's tough. I would say the biggest uh, issue is, you know, the left did a horrible thing by weaponizing culture and weaponizing art and filmmaking in that regard. Um, and then I think the right thought that the answer to that was to weaponize it on our side and our turn and look for sort of a political bottom line with everything. So you're not going to really get, I, I think it's very difficult to get conservatives to want to invest in the culture because, you know, to create really good everlasting culture, I mean, there's not going to really going to be a kind of political bottom line to it. I mean, I can't, I mean, I did talk about how this film is a uh, reflection on cancel culture in some ways, but I, I, it's not, there's no political bottom line to this movie. Um, and that's really what art is, you know, truly great art is just, is art for art's sake. It's, you know, it's films for filmmaking's sake. And, and so if I could say, if they could get more into the, we want to invest in, restoring the culture it res, uh, invest in creating works that's going to unite people that's going to bring people together that's going to be a bridge rather than you know a weapon to cast into this uh, awful cultural war that we have going on you know if i can have democrats and republicans sit and watch my movie together and then at the end of the film talk about it together and have something that they both can relate to then I did something good. I did something good. I did something that that I, that I gave people something to experience with each other, and that is what truly makes culture great. And that's what we need to be focused on building. Yeah, I agree. Great storytelling and great art have to be above political messaging. Uh, nobody likes to be, uh, you know, be preached to. Not even on the left, which is why um, you know some of the some of the left-leaning films politically that hammer people over the head with their messaging fail miserably because people want to be entertained first and foremost. I think that's something that you were alluding to a minute ago when you said that uh, it's not good for conservatives to weaponize culture either. I think one thing conservatives need to learn a little more is the, the importance and the significance of storytelling and of creative creating narratives that first and foremost entertain people but that embody the values and ideals that we hold to be true um, with, without lecturing people. You'd agree with that? Yeah, well, absolutely. So, you know, I would say that, you know, what, what we, what happened in the 20th century, the late 20th century uh, is, you know, we have this wonderful deposit of Western culture, you know, 2000 years of it, uh, arc from architecture to literature to paintings, uh, and then filmmaking added on uh, towards the towards the end of all of that. Um, this rich well to draw from, and unfortunately, you know, with the rise of communism and leftism and Marxism uh, in the late twentieth century, uh, there was this attempt to just sort of destroy all of that. Um, and modernism, so it was goal was to bury all that. So you know, if you, I, I like to talk a lot about uh, architecture. Uh, with people very often, you know, if you drive through the San Fernando Valley, it's just this, this wasteland of flat modernist architecture. And uh, what, you know, any, a way, I guess you could say, but, you know, would be restoring the culture is like looking back on people who made beautiful, great things and replacing this, the, the ugly modern monstrosities with, with, you know, something in the spirit of that. Uh, now, the, the name of my production company is Palindrome Pictures, 
And uh, the symbol of that is, you know, one foot in the past and one foot in the future, and they're all connected and bridged. Uh, and that should be the the conservative or the or the traditional artist's goal is to uh, to bridge that beautiful past that you know and to build uh, with with the future that's coming forward. Yeah, uh, the late conservative philosopher Roger Scruton has a lot to say about uh, beauty and architecture and uh, the failure of modern architecture to to strive for the true and the good and the beautiful and but the failure of modern art in general to do that. And I, I do think that's one thing that conservatives should strive for is, as you put it so nicely, is uh, connecting the past and the future, uh, carrying down that incredible cultural legacy of Western civilization and, and expanding on that, but always striving for the true, the good, and the beautiful in storytelling. Always. Yes, um, absolutely. And it, Roger Scruton is very much an, an influence of mine. Yes. Oh, interesting. Uh, but I see a lot of things on Netflix that strike me as just flat out demonic. And I'm thinking, what is happening to our culture? What is going on in the film world? I mean, it's, it's just very disturbing sometimes. How do we kind of pull back from that? Oh, I, I agree with you. I'm, I'm disgusted with it myself. Uh, it, like, again, you know, it's, it's, it's a tough, um, line to walk because uh, you know then because i would feel like the conservative answer to that well we're gonna make you know uh conservative the uh, we're gonna push the conservative message hard you know and create our our movies and that you know that doesn't do anything you know we have to empower real artists here you know, you know artists that and that you know and they're out there they're out there i'm not that you know i'm not the only one there's plenty of the people who worked on this uh uh, film and or who gave contributions to it in some way, or, you know, or people or, or serious artists that work in the industry, uh, people like my, uh, I won't use his name to, not to out him because he didn't want to be outed, but uh, you know, he's a uh, art director that's working on various HBO shows uh, right now, uh, and uh, they're out there. We have to empower these artists because they care. They they care about creating good work that's not going to get into this woke garbage. Um, you know, but it's not going to it's not, it's not going to get you to go out there and, and vote for vote vote for Donald Trump or vote Republican. What it's going to do is it's going to fill your human soul with its need for for catharsis and its need for, for affirmation of existence. And the, that's what we need to look out and empower. Um, there are people out there doing it. Uh, I you know, I as to how we organize that, that's very difficult. It's it's extraordinarily difficult. Um I'm doing the best I can with, with where I'm at and with what I have. Um, and I hope Exemplum does well enough that it can en enable me to do my next project and bring more of those people on board and, 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 and just keep building that coalition. Or if there's another coalition out there that's, that's already building that, that I don't know of and I'm not aware about, and you know, if we can join forces. Great. Cause we need to work in together. Yeah, and along those lines, I think a lot of conservatives these days are suggesting that we expend less time and energy taking back the existing institutions of the culture, like Hollywood, and instead uh, put our energies toward creating a, a kind of a parallel culture, an alternate culture in which we create our own films and TV series, our own entertainment, our own distribution systems, uh, and find our audiences that way. What, what do you think about that idea of a parallel culture? I think it's. I think that's true. I think it's a, a a good idea. It's certainly one that I hold to. I just think the question is, you know, are you building a parallel culture, or are you just building an echo chamber, or are you just building, or you know, as I like to tell some people, sometimes you're just building a conservative gulag, so certain people who want to uh, be kings of that gulag can overrule us, you know, because you have to, because if you are going to be creating that parallel culture, then you have to be creating that that culture. Something that's really special and beautiful that are gonna you know and that culture will will blossom you know it will bring other people into it it'll bring uh, liberal minded people or left wing minded people in because it will be interesting it'll be special uh, and people want to partake and participate in something like that um, so yeah I do I do support that um, and uh, you know there I, I do think that technology and the way things have uh, changed over the decades are certainly are enabling that because it's just now you're able to create things and just and put them out there. Um, you know the, those systems of power are are 
are crumbling. Uh, and that what probably will happen is we'll probably go through like an age where, you know, you have these independent artists who are doing their own thing, putting them out there, building an audience. And, uh, and then they create their own institutions. Uh, and that, that, that's all, that's all positive. Um, yeah. You seem to have gotten off to a good start in terms of blazing your own trail um, rather than getting in the Hollywood game. Do you, do you have any advice for conserv- other conservative culture makers about doing that, about uh, kind of, you know, making it happen for themselves and not trying to go through the standard channels of the Hollywood system? Yeah, this is a very good question. I would say, yes, do it. You have to do it yourself. I mean, there's always, you know, every path is different. My path is different path is different every path is different you know there there are definitely people who just do the traditional route and go through the system and they everything works out fine for them and then there are people that go my way everything is a disaster for them and then the people that go my way everything you know works out so i don't ha- i can't say what is you know going to happen but i can say this you know if you want it you have to get it done yourself because you can try and wait but I can tell you that nobody is going to say yes to you. So you have to try and just figure out how can I get done what it is I need to get done. Um, You know, people might ask me, you know, oh, should I make a feature film or should I make a short film? Um, That's difficult uh, for me to say. You know, short films, they're the reason why I did the feature film route is because short films are a dime a dozen. And, um, um, Short films are a dime a dozen, and you kind of have no idea uh, what's going to come out of that. You could make them, and then you put them out in a film festival, and then you know, then you're waiting for someone to hire you for something, and there's really no money to be made. You know, with at least a feature film, and you go through the pain and the struggle of doing that on a low budget, you at least have a product that you could maybe sell to people, and in that, you might be able to move on to your next product. So, I would say if you're conservative filmmaker out or just a regular filmmaker out there and you're trying to make things happen on your own you know get whatever resources you can and make your movie i think also with short films you almost have to create this perfect diamond of a film i mean it's such a short you you have such a short amount of time that you're working with it's got to be perfect and outstanding in every way and with a feature film you almost it's almost like you have a little more leeway to make a few missteps here and there as long as you get the overall uh, effect that you're trying to to make, um, and so I, I think probably you might as well just go for the feature film and and do the- absolutely absolutely. And you know, I'll say the quiet. It's really tough, you know, because this might upset some people. But you know, after having been through the film festival route, uh, I, I hate to say this because I know how the amount of work it takes to create a good short film. But like, if I were a producer. A short film tells me nothing about your ability to hold a narrative for 90 plus minutes. It just doesn't. It it, re- it really doesn't. It might give me an idea how you can handle a commercial, maybe even a television show episode, but it gives me no idea as to how you can, can hold people for 90 plus minutes. And so if you really want to advertise your filmmaking chops in the feature realm, you just have to do that. What's the next step for your film, for example, and where, where uh, and how can people see it? Great. Yeah, well, it's going to be going live Thursday on Vimeo On Demand, uh, rental price one ninety nine, so less than a price of a uh, cup of coffee, and uh, purchase price nine ninety nine. Uh, that's going to be our first platform, and then uh, we're going to be hopefully moving on to Google Play and Tubi in the next few weeks here, and that's when we're going to go ahead and do our major media blitz. Breitbart's going to be giving us lots of promotion on it, uh, and... Alex Marlowe, our editor-in-chief and CEO, Larry Soloff, came to my premiere. They both really love the film, and so they're very happy to champion it. Uh, and, yeah, that's going to be, you know, everybody will know about it then. Okay. Uh, fantastic. And what's, do you know already what your next project might be or what you want it to be? Or are you just, uh, you're still in the process of this one? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I already have, like I said, I already had that political thriller uh uh, written before I need to need a good three weeks in the writing room to tinker it because I wrote that at a different time. Uh, 
uh, I don't think that that's necessarily the next film for me, uh, but there, there are a couple of ideas that I'm working on, some more low-budget sci-fis. I think if I can get a... I've already proven that, you know, once I have the budget, I can write in what that needs. So if I am able to... If my next project can be in the $100,000, $200,000 budget range, um, then I'm confident that I can make the movie that will deliver uh, what that needs and be special for, for what that range is. What are you watching now that you're excited about or that's um, interesting to you or something you would recommend? Uh, wow. Uh, I, yeah, I, I got to think about that one. Uh, yeah, you already mentioned a couple of uh, Fritz Lang's movies that you thought were outstanding and uh but I'm just wondering if there's anything out there. Yeah. Uh, you know, I had mentioned this, uh, over, over Christmas. Um, uh, but it's, it's still a wonderful film. And I, 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 I recommend people give it a watch. It's, it's, you know, all four hours of it, but I would re- recommend Ingmar Bergman's Fanny and Alexander. If you haven't seen it, it's really a, a wonderful, remarkable film, um, about a boy's journey, uh, you know, losing his father and going, suffering an abusive stepfather and a lot of spiritual reflections and themes in that. So you have the time to watch Fanny's Alexander, I would recommend that. And anything current that uh, that you like, or is it all just... Yeah, actually, you know, I did, I watched uh, The Whale, Darren Aronofsky's The Whale, um, this past Friday. Uh, and you know what? I, I actually, it's not a perfect film. I think the ending shot is, is definitely, it does not work. Um, but I, I actually did enjoy it. I think uh, I can see why the critics were so divided on it because it is not politically correct um, in how it handles um, the concept, uh, the topic of obesity. It, it treats uh, his eating disorder like it, like a, like a drug addiction. But it does have some very interesting spiritual reflections in there, and that uh, Aronofsky does not, for one second, uh, he does not for one second ask you to approve. Of Brendan Fraser's character, he presents them, and he says the, the, he wants you to feel, I would say, disgusted and repulsed by him. But at the same time, he he leaves you with a question: you know, is it better to hate uh, a man for his sins and what he has done, or is it better to try and find understanding uh, of him and in that find compassion and maybe even mercy? And I think that's where the the Herman Melville uh, Moby Dick. Uh, metaphor really uh, resonates because he is Moby Dick and his daughter is Ahab. And it's a reflection about her hatred of her father and, you know, and it's destroying her soul. Speaking of sin, that, that takes me back to your film Exemplum and the tagline for it, which I thought was a very clever tagline. It's hate the sinner, love the sin, uh, which, is, which is kind of a twist on what it actually should be, which is uh, love the sinner and hate the sin. What, why did you uh, give it that twist? Very clever. Yeah, I think it's well. It's because uh, that that's Colin, Father Colin Jacoby's uh, character. He's in love with the sin. He's in love with people's wrongdoing, and he uses that to benefit himself. But he but he hates the people for for doing it. Uh, do Do you see yourself mostly as a screenwriter or a director, or you also acted in the lead in that film? Um, and did you do that out of necessity, being the lead, or did you? Do you have acting ambitions? Yes. Uh, no, no. It was 100% a, a budgetary choice. Uh, I am a writer, director. I have no desire, no desire at all to keep, uh, to do this again. I mean, the, the it was very difficult. I mean, it, it, to be directing yourself uh, at this level of budget, but I, but I had to because this is, a, like I said, we made this movie for $9,500 and uh, shooting over seven weekends uh, to get, a talented actor who is going to come out, be a part of that for, you know, for absolutely no money was, was, I knew it was going to be very difficult and just not having someone else's schedule to maintain. So that's why I decided to play the uh, role. I wanted to ask you about if, if you don't mind talking about it, I know that you were going through some personal struggles at the time that you were making the film, which really contributed to, uh, the stress level of, of getting it all done and, and directing and writing and starring and producing in this thing. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Oh, sure, sure. You know, I mean, uh, anybody who wants to see the story in full, uh, there's a video uh, on our Instagram page, on my Instagram page, at Proland uh, Films is the Instagram handle. Uh, you can give the full story that I that I gave uh, at the film's premiere. Uh, but basically, yeah, we, you know, I got the funds and then COVID hit. 
and then trying to write this, you know, when the whole, our whole society is topsy turvy was extremely difficult. I mean, I didn't even know what things were going to look like by the time came to shoot this film. Uh, so, but I just kept, you know, pushing on. And then once I had the script done and then, you know, we discovered my wife was pregnant with our first child. Uh, then a pipe burst uh, up above us. Our neighbor who was re- uh, renovating his unit uh, just was an act of negligence and he flooded our whole uh, apartment, uh, our whole condo, uh, actually. And so we had to live in Airbnbs for the next five months. So, yeah, I was like, we we're living in Airbnbs. My wife's pregnant. I have to get this film shot because I know I'm never going to get an opportunity. And then, you know, I persisted and we got it done. Well, I wondered if all of that personal stress that was going on behind the scenes contributed to the intensity of your acting performance. Cause I was thinking that as I watched the film, because I knew you had been through a lot of personal stuff while you were filming it. And I wondered if, uh, if that helped you with the character in any way, if you were able to bring that kind of stress and, and uh, personal anguish to the role. Well, it's certainly possible. I mean, you know, when you see me on screen, you like, Literally 10 seconds ago, uh, I'm thinking to myself about how the heck am I going to like, how am I going to get, you know, the next location? You know, what am I going to order for food for people? Uh, You know, uh, what's my wife, you know, doing right now? I mean, I'm going, I have 20 different things going on in my, in my mind. And then, you know, I yell action and I have to be calling Jacoby. So you might be right about that. Yeah. Paul, what is the best way for people to keep up with you? Yeah, you can follow uh, follow me on Instagram at Proland Films uh, or on Twitter at Proland Films. Uh, those are probably the two of the best methods. Uh, or you know, uh, you can follow me over at Breitbart News uh, you know, with my name Paul Blois B O I S, uh, and that's where we'll be doing a lot of promotion. Uh, yeah, those places. Fantastic. Well, best of luck with the film. Um, and thanks for coming on the Right Take podcast. I'm really looking forward to seeing what you do next, how uh, Exemplum plays out, and uh, then what your next project is. Well, thank you, Mark. It was a real pleasure uh, being here, and uh, I hope I can come on to your podcast uh, many times to discuss my projects. That would be awesome. Thanks again, Paul. Thank you. The Right Take with Mark Tapson is a project of the David Horowitz Freedom Center and Front Page Magazine. Unauthorized reproduction of this podcast without express written consent is prohibited.